Should I start talking? Okay, and it's recording, so we'll just see. Okay, we've got 15 participants, 17 participants so far. See, I don't see that. Um, oh, attendees. Right, it says attendees, 26, 27, 29. Okay, well, there, I guess, hi guys. Now, hi everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're Emily. Um, Diane, Heather, oh yay, everybody's yay, here. Awesome. Lisa, Lucy, um, Alex, all right, Alex, we've got Allison. Hi, guys. Good job. Hi, everybody. We're just taking a minute while everyone hops online. Um, yeah. Loiter amongst yourself. <laughs> it's so good to see everybody. I, it's, it's nice to at least have this minute to talk. <laughs> Okay, so we've got 62 people right now, 63 online, which is awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you guys were all able to figure this all out. I don't know if you guys have done Zoom before. I personally maybe have, but I've never hosted. So this will yeah, be Yeah, we're just all, I think it's nice to have this minute together, right? Because I think we're all kind of in the same boat and all wondering like, how do we get through this? And it's nice to have a way to get together. And talk about it. All right. Well, maybe we'll just kind of we'll just kind of do an intro and get going. We have we have yeah. a bit of content to address today, so we don't want to not get to everything. So yeah. So hi everybody. Welcome to our very first virtual Soul Food Salon. Um, unfortunately, this may be the format for the next few months. Uh, so let's learn through this together. Um, we all hope that you're doing well, that you're doing okay, that you're staying safe, and that you're healthy. I know us uh, living in the Bay Area, we are on lockdown, and I'm not sure. Uh, I know we have attendees from different places, which we're going to discuss in just a minute, but we're hoping that today we will help relieve maybe some anxiety that you guys are having, uh, maybe bring a little joy, a little wisdom, sense of community. So those are our hopes today. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jeannie Rosner. I am the founder and organizer of Soul Food Salon. I'm a retired pediatric anesthesiologist. I retired that um, about nine years ago and I started teaching nutrition, health and wellness in our local middle and high schools. And then in 2014, I started Soul Food Salon. And essentially, many of you might know who I am and have come to some of the events, but I just want to introduce myself to those that perhaps don't know who I am. Essentially, my goal is to be as healthy as I can. And I am constantly learning. And my goal is to learn and to teach. And so whomever wants to come with me on that journey to learn um, is part of the Soul Food Salon community. So welcome. Our model is that we have events once a month. We don't do anything in the summer and they're live events. As I mentioned, this is our first virtual event. I live in Woodside, California, Northern, in Northern California, and we do the events. We try to alternate between a talk and a cooking event each, every other month. And um, you can, I have a website, which I keep updated all the time. And that website is soulfoodsalon.com. And when you go on that website, you can see all of our, all the content that we have presented in the past. Uh, whether it be salons uh, with recipes and cooking events, PowerPoint presentations, all of that's there. And so like Jen, Jennifer, um, she and I met at uh, the beginning, maybe the end of 2014. Jennifer was one of my very first presenters in January of 2015. She had just had a book that came out, the 52 New Foods Challenge, and she presented. And then subsequently we have done a food challenge for a couple years through Soul Food Salon. And our most recent food challenge was in 20, the whole year of 2019. And essentially what the food challenge that I entertained and that Jennifer has done in the past as well is presenting basically a seasonal ingredient. Uh, we did it once a week and I presented nutritional information about that ingredient. And then in 2019, every time I introduced an ingredient, I presented a recipe that went with that ingredient. So all of that's up on my website and I have an ebook that I created of all the recipes and the photography of the recipes is my photography. So you can, you can access that all on my website. Um, currently, we are, I'm pretty active on social media, Instagram, Facebook, 
mainly Instagram, some on Facebook. I also have a YouTube channel. However, on Instagram this year, I have partnered with another physician down in San Diego, Angie Neeson, and she might even be here. I, she is here. Hello, Angie. Um, so Angie's on board. She, um, she and I are really promoting this year for people to cook more at home and to use eat more plants. And so she and I are um, posting recipes throughout the weeks. We are showing photos of them and we are actually writing out the recipe so you can access it. And we're using the hashtag eat more plants. So the hope is that most of you will follow us. If you're on Instagram, I'm again at Soul Food Salon. My YouTube and my uh, Facebook is also Soul Food Salon, all one word. And Angie's name is at Flavors for Wellness MD, and the four is the number four. So follow both of us. Um, we'll inspire you, hopefully, to cook more with plants and to eat more plants. And hopefully, you'll do some inspire. You know, you'll inspire us as well with different recipes. So as I mentioned, I have a YouTube channel, and on that channel, we uh, videotape many of our salons. Those are all there. This uh, salon is being recorded, and I will upload it upload it to the YouTube channel in the next few days or so. Um, so you can, if you have to jump off from this call, you can always access uh, the conversation at a later date and you can share it with others. And um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about today. So as I mentioned, today is our first event virtually. So bear with us where we did like a little run through and I think, I think we got it together. So today I have the pleasure to introduce Jennifer Tyler Lee and Anisha Patel. They are the co-authors of the amazing cookbook, Half the Sugar, All the Love. So Jennifer is an award-winning author, game creator, self-trained home cook, and healthy eating advocate who earned her certificate in nutrition and healthy living from Cornell University. And Anisha is an associate professor in the Division of General Pediatrics at Stanford University. And she is also an affiliate member at UCSF. All right, so they have quite the bio and they're quite the uh, wealth of knowledge. So today's format is gonna go like this. Jennifer and Anisha are gonna share this, their wonderful presentation with the focus primarily on uh, sugar, reducing our sugar. They're gonna give us some strategies on how we can reduce the amount of sugar that we're eating on a daily basis while also boosting fruits and vegetables. Throughout the event, we are going to ask some questions. We would like this to be as interactive as possible. And so that being said, there's gonna be a couple questions that we're gonna to pose to the audience and we want you to answer them. Should be pretty easy to do, pretty self-explanatory. And then the other thing we're going to do is, um, and actually I want you guys to help me to do this right now, in fact. So at the bottom of your screen, you should have a little toolbar and there should be a little chat box and it says chat underneath it. Can you guys do me a favor and click on that chat box right now and say something? Hi, I'm from New York. Hi, this is, you know, Angie from San Diego. Just let me know y'all are there. Because we're going to use the chat box throughout the event as well. And again, that's to help um, have more interaction. Um, uh, Great. I'm seeing this all in the Q&A. Thank you so much. This is really great. I see from Sarah and Sabrina. Hi. I'm not Allison. seeing anything on my chat. Um, is it I in your Q&A? &A. It's in the Q&A. Yes, it's in my Q&A. Why great. is it not showing up in the chat? That's oh. fine. This is good. The Q&A is perfect. This okay, is perfect. Okay, great. So we, um, I'm going to be manning this. So throughout the presentation, as these guys are doing the presentation, I will be uh, looking at some of the questions, I will chime in as perhaps something that comes up that maybe they need to clarify or go a little deeper with. Um, and we will use this throughout the event. And if at the end we have a little bit of extra time, we can answer even more questions. So essentially the presentation is going to go on after Anisha and Jennifer are done actually doing the presentation. Then Jennifer is going to do a cooking demo of, I believe, three recipes. And those recipes will be up on my website that you can access after the event. So hopefully with all of us kind of homebound right now, we can try and cook with our kids and just have fun. So yeah. without further ado, I'm going to hand over everything to these guys. Thanks. Okay, guys, I'm going to share my screen here um, so that we can 
uh, dive into this presentation. I just want to say thank you so much for coming out today. I really hope that um, what we're able to do is just come together and share some ideas and help everybody feel positive and, and inspired and a little less stressed. <laughs> so I know like I'm sort of figuring it out by the minute here. So um, thanks to Jeannie for hosting us today and thanks to everyone for coming. It's just really, really, really exciting to see everyone together. All right, so let me um, talk you through really quickly what we're gonna do agenda wise. We're going to discuss really quickly just some tips to stay healthy because we know that's what uh, is on everybody's mind right now. Then we'll go through our basics of sort of sugar 101. Anisha and I teach a lecture at Stanford and we'll hear some of the, um, some of the information from that lecture. Um, we'll also go through and debunk some myths and we're hoping that uh, this will be participatory and we want you to be polling. We've got little polls and we want you to be engaging to sort of help us debunk some myths. Then we'll share practical strategies and then I'll do a live cooking demo. And I'm not quite sure how that's going to go, but we're going to try it. And I've got my whole kitchen set up with um, delicious to how to make some of the favorite ones from my, from. Um, so that said, let's dive into tips to stay healthy. Great. Thanks, Jen, for that um, introduction. So as you all know, um, you know, COVID definitely has everybody worried and just want to kind of reassure you of some ideas and tips to stay healthy um, during this current outbreak. So one, to increase resiliency, it's really important to also, um, in addition to thinking about eating a balanced diet, which is what we're going to talk about today, really making sure you're getting adequate sleep. And the sleep recommendations vary by age. So for infants, up to 16 hours. But for adults and most um, school-aged children, 8 to 10 hours is what's required. So just make sure you get enough sleep. Uh, practicing good hygiene. Um, you, guys, you all probably have heard all these recommendations already, but just making sure you're coughing into your arm. If you have any symptoms, call your health provider. Um, and definitely don't go into the ER. Um, social distancing here in the Bay Area, as we talked about, we're kind of in, in shelter mode. So we're um, in our homes, making sure that we're staying with our families and cleaning you know, high touch surfaces. And then lastly, today, we're really gonna focus on um, this concept of eating a balanced diet. We know that when the kids are home, whether that's like on vacation or over the summer, they tend to actually eat a little less healthily and so it's important to um, really think about um, providing them with um, healthy snacks and food options. And so we're gonna talk more about that today. Awesome. So again, guys, uh, sorry, it wasn't the chat function that you can interact with us. It's through the Q&A. So if you have any questions at the bottom of your screen, just click Q&A and type it in and I will do my best to, to address them. We have people from Ohio, from Minneapolis, from New York, all over California. So happy to have you guys. That's awesome. I love it. Okay. Um, so let's just get all on the same page around added sugar uh, with a definition. Okay. So Anisha talked about how just eating a consistent, balanced diet is really important to stay resilient and reducing added sugar and eating more plants, eating more fruits and vegetables, is just a good thing to do. So when we talk about added sugar, what we mean is sugar that's used in processing and preparing foods and drinks, sugar that's eaten separately or that's added to foods at your table. Um, so this can be honey, it can be maple syrup, molasses, agave, <laughs> as well as granulated sugar, corn syrup, and um, added sugars like that. We're also gonna talk today about naturally occurring sugars, which are different than added sugars, and we're going to explain why. So I feel like the word on added sugar now is kind of out there in the media. You're probably seeing a lot on television, but just really quickly, I like this figure because it just shows you that um, the health impacts of added sugar really do impact most organ systems. So you know, you've already heard about weight gain associated with added sugar, probably um, diabetes is also um, something that is of concern, particularly type 2 diabetes, which we are seeing clinically among children and adolescents. 
in our clinics. Um, also seeing abnormal cholesterol levels in young children, as well as fatty liver disease. Um, so we, you know, oftentimes we'll get some blood tests to check on that, and we do see elevations in liver function tests in young children as well. So those are all important ramifications of consuming too much added sugar. I think it's important also to think about craving and sugar tolerance. A lot of work coming out of UCSF has shown that there are addictive properties to added sugar, and any of you who've tried to cut out added sugar in your diet may have felt those um, cravings. Um, dental caries, cavities we know, are one of the most common chronic conditions among young children here in the U.S., and so um, consuming too much added sugar can also lead to dental cavities as well. So it's important to really think about these health impacts and how you can make changes in your diet to really um, lessen some of the impact um, long term. Right. Okay, so in terms of the recommendations, the ones that we follow in our book, Half the Sugar, All the Love, are the American Heart Association recommendations. There are a couple of different reg recommendations. These are the ones that are most conservative. So women, is tea, six teaspoons a day or 24 grams. And just um, as a rule of thumb, four grams equal one teaspoon. It's actually, it kind of varies by type of sugar and we go through in detail in that in the book. Um, but four grams is kind of the rough number that's for easy calculating. So women should be thinking about a daily limit of six teaspoons or 24 grams. Men, nine teaspoons or 36 grams. Kids over the age of two, um, between three and six teaspoons, and then kids under the age of two, zero. And the reason why is because that's when they're developing their um, taste preferences, and it's really recommended that added sugar is not part of their diet there so that they can, um, they can sort of reduce that preference for sweet foods. Oh, and the other thing I should note here, we're currently consuming three times these recommended daily limit numbers. Um, and that's why we're kind of getting into this problem with, um, with the diseases that Venetia talked about. So can I chime in for a sec? The question, I'm just gonna kind of chime some of the questions that are coming in. Sure. So um, we have a question that says, Right now, during all of this stressful time, I am eating so much junk. Um, any ideas on how I can reduce that? Right. Um, you know, I've got a brownie recipe that we're going to cook together today. <laughs> so I get it. Um, wanting to, craving some of those things during stressful times is, I think, normal. And um, hopefully we're going to give you a few ways to make those things. But done in a healthier way. So the brownies are sweetened with sweet potato and they have less than half the sugar of a box brownie mix. So, um, you know, we're not advocating for eating brownies every day, but when you do, um, and you can make them in a slightly healthier way. Then... You're echoing weird, Jen. Is that on? Okay. All right, so um, we're going to move on to a slightly more interactive portion of the um, presentation where we're going to actually have a polling feature. And so you'll have an opportunity to vote and then we will share um, the results. So the first um, question we're going to talk about is um, here, you can see it on the screen here, it's popped up. It's are less refined sugars better than more refined sugars? And just so you know the terminology, so refined sugars means sugars that have been processed. So let's say, for example, you have sugar cane. Sugar cane is in its raw form, you know, growing somewhere, and then it's processed to make table sugar or granulate sugar. So that's considered refined sugar. A less refined sugar is something like honey, agave, or maple syrup that's naturally occurring and really goes through minimal processing. So do you think that those less refined sugars, such as table um, you know, sugar or granulated sugar is um, healthier than the, um, sorry, the less refined is um, better than the more refined? Okay, I love this polling feature. <laughs> I'm so excited. So everybody can just so take a moment and click it. on the yes or the no. Um, can, whatever you think the answer are? is. Can, can, is everybody seeing this at the same time? No. Okay, so right now, um, all right, so I've got, how many people have voted? 63 people have voted. Okay, I'm gonna give you 
30 more seconds to vote. Everybody vote. Uh, as they're voting, can I ask a question? Yes. Is that all right? Just because I, I want to try to keep on top of the questions. Does soda include all carbonated sparkling water? So soda, well, soda is a kind of colloquial term. I think the general term that we use when we're talking about added sugar is actually sugar-sweetened beverages. And sugar-sweetened beverages are any drinks that actually have added sugar in them. So that would include, you know, what we consider sodas like you know, Cokes or Pepsis, Sprites, um, also sports drinks or electrolyte replacement beverages, some of the boba drinks that you see on the market, um, coffees or tea. So it's pretty much anything where you're adding sugar to the product. Um, there are naturally occurring sugars that are present in some beverages. So for example, you know, milk has lactose, which is actually a naturally occurring sugar that is actually healthy. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but we don't want you to necessarily restrict those healthy sugars that are naturally occurring intrinsic to food products and beverages. There is a difference though, Anisha, that you talk about with carbonated water and regular water. Yes, so for young children in particular, there were some um, recent beverage recommendations that came out. A lot of the um, health organizations, including the um, Dietetic Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Dental Associations have come up with beverage recommendations for zero to five-year-olds. And in those beverage recommendations, they don't recommend carbonated um, beverages. Um, the main reason is because of um, there's some concern that the acidity of those carbonated beverages can actually be detrimental to tooth enamel. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sharing um, our polling results. Love this. So 72% of people said less refined sugars are better than more refined sugars. Okay, so let's, let me just stop this and move to the next slide. <clears throat> All right, so in the book, Half the Sugar, All the Love, you'll see this figure, um, and the figure is supposed to demonstrate to you like how many different names for added sugar. It could be challenging for us as families and consumers and um, individuals to really understand what's in different foods that we're eating and whether these different types of sugars are healthier than other added sugars. But overall, all these added sugars count towards your daily limit. So even though a sugar may be less refined, such as agave or honey or some of the things listed here, such as coconut sugar, doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthier for you and it should count towards your daily limit. That being said, <coughs> Sample does have some general beneficial properties. And so now during this time when we may develop cough, for example, um, some um, a lot of physicians actually recommend that you use honey rather than over-the-counter cough and cold medications because they haven't been shown to be um, effective. So that is an example of why honey could be a healthier option. But then again, if you're cooking with it, it should still count towards your um, daily limit. Right. So one thing, I'm just gonna chime in for a sec. So I do a lot of teaching in our middle and high schools and I do a whole lesson about added sugar. And essentially what I say is when you look at your ingredient list, your first and second ingredients are gonna be the main component of that item. So you really wanna to want to avoid sugar if you can in, any of, in those first few ingredients. Anything that has O-S-E at the end of it signifies a type of sugar. So on this, picture that you can see, we can see, I see fructose, sucrose, maltose, all of those are sugars. So anytime there's OSE at the end of the word, that is a type of, of sugar. So just, and the food industry has become quite savvy and quite smart in this. They know now that we're educating you all that like, oh, these people are not going to buy this item because it has sugar in the first or second ingredient. What they've done is they've used a smattering of all of these different, this different sweeteners so often there could be numerous sweeteners in one item. And if they actually only had it be as sugar, it would be the first or second ingredient. So I think the other thing that's important to note here is swapping honey for granulated sugar, for example, in a recipe is not making it any help. Um, so it still counts as added sugar. And actually honey has more grams of sugar per teaspoon than granulated sugar. So a lot of questions I get when it comes to cooking is, oh, well, if I just swap it for honey, then isn't it better? And really you wanna go back to all added sugar is sugar. And you wanna think about reducing all types of sugar, both refined and unrefined, not swapping one for another. Okay, so let's go to the next 
myth. Um, and I'm going to put up our little poll here. Um, give me a second. All right, launching my poll. So fruit has sugar, therefore you should avoid it. Can you all vote on that? Okay, we're going to take a minute here. This came up a lot. Um, Anisha and I have been talking a lot to the press in the last three months um, as we launched our book. And this question of fruit and vegetables and isn't, isn't there sugar in sweet potato? Isn't there sugar in strawberries? You know, shouldn't we be concerned about that? Is that really a healthier way to sweeten? That came up um, pretty consistently in all of the conversations that we had. So um, curious to know what everybody thinks. All right, we have a, a, a pretty clear winner here. All right, can you guys see that result on the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, this is correct. Um, we should not be avoiding fruit. We need to be eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, so naturally occurring sugars are different than added sugars. Um, so the naturally occurring sugar in an orange or an apple or a date or a pear is different than honey or uh, granulated sugar or agave. And the difference is fiber. So that pear comes naturally packaged with fiber and that fiber helps slow absorption of the sugar in your body to prevent some of the health conditions that we've been talking about. And um, Anisha can talk to this data too, but we need to be eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, so if we can find more ways to work them into our diet and reduce sugar, it's a good thing. Okay, so next up, sugar substitutes. So yeah, so sugar substitutes are a smarter choice. We're gonna have another polling for this. So, there we go. Okay, launch. And by sugar substitutes, we mean um, non-nutritive, um, you know, sugar substitutes such as sucralose, saccharin, um, monk fruit, stevia, and the raw. We're in lumping them all together. So generally, right. speaking, do you feel like these are a smarter choice over um, just using table sugar, for example. Right, so like is stevia. Stevia comes up a lot um, as we, we talk about sugar substitutes. Are people out there using stevia, monk fruit? These are all substitutes for sugar that we've heard about. Um, and we're curious, do you think stevia, monk fruit is a smarter choice than sugar? Okay, interesting. Okay. I'm gonna yeah, go so ahead. I've gotten a few questions about this. So okay, great. Good. Yeah, I'm gonna address this. What do you see? Um, one of the questions was about stevia and truvia. Is that yeah. is that healthy? Right. Yeah, that's what we're gonna address right now. So put in your vote. What do you think is stevia? a uh, smarter choice than using granulated sugar, for example. Here's another question that maybe we could, before we go on to the answer. Um, in your slide, when you were talking about lists of sugars, you had date sugar on there, but now in acknowledgement of the fiber, is it okay to sub dates for cane sugar? I know that you use dates in many of your recipes, so. Yes, it's a really great point. So date sugar is not the same, date syrup is not the same as a whole date. And the difference is in date sugar, that fiber is removed um, uh, in order to create that um, shelf stable date sugar. Um, the whole date comes with the fiber. Uh, um, so that's the difference. So we use whole dates as opposed to date <coughs> syrup or date sugar, which are considered added sugars. And then just also with um, the sugars, since we're still on the topic, I don't, uh, someone said that they did not see yakun syrup, Y-A-C-O-N, I don't know if that's how you pronounce yakun syrup, which is supposed to be the healthiest. Is that, do you guys know anything about that? 
I actually don't know about that. Jen, do you know about that? I'd have to look that up and get back to you. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. I, I mean, if it's a, yeah, I'd have to look that up. I'm guessing if it's a syrup, it probably has the fiber removed. So it would still count as an added sugar um, and would still be counted towards your daily limit. Okay. But right. we can look it up and follow up. All and right. What, so about, what about xylitol? Okay. So xylitol falls in the sugar substitutes. Um, and I'm going to get into some of the reasons why they are not actually a smarter choice. And it looks like many of you already know this. So that's great. Okay, good. All right. So let's talk through that. Okay. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, sugar substitutes include monk fruit, stevia, xylitol, sucralose, saccharin. There's many, many of them out there. Some of them are artificial. Some of them are naturally occurring. Um, but regardless, we know that um, all of these non-nutritive sweeteners or sugar substitutes taste many times sweeter than just regular sugar. In fact, up to 20,000 times as sweet. And so if we're trying to like reduce the amount of sugar in our added sugar in our diet and really try to become more accustomed to accepting less healthy foods, this really isn't going to help anyone. Um, in addition, there are also studies that are suggesting that some of these artificial sweeteners in particular, there hasn't been as much data on the stevia or the monk fruit, however, um, but those artificial sweeteners may be upsetting the gut flora. Um, and that can actually lead to health problems as well. Um, and lastly, there's also a lack of um, data on the long-term health impacts of some of these um, non-nutritive sweeteners. So in particular for children, there really are no studies. And these um, non-nutritive sweeteners haven't been around a long time. Stevia, monk fruit, for example, relatively um, new to the market. They right now have a designation by the Food and Drug Administration. It's called generally recognized as safe, which basically means that experts got together and decided that these are probably not harmful in the diet, but they haven't been fully evaluated. So for all those reasons um, in the book, and generally speaking, we um, recommend that most folks avoid sugar substitutes when possible. I do think, however, they can have some utility. So for example, um, you know, if children are chewing chewing gum, you know, for dental caries um, reduction, maybe a role for xylitol um, from that sense. But generally speaking, if you're going to cook with some of these sugars or use it in your tea or coffee, I think just sticking with regular sugar or using a, a lower amount is probably a healthier option. Yeah. So just a few things just to chime in with responses that people are putting in. Um, Reshma Shah, a, a pediatrician in the area, she said date paste is a good option. Okay. The whole date that's already pureed for you. Yeah. Um, a couple people have talked more about the Yacon syrup. Um, that's a high FOS sugar substitute. And a, a, it has some prebiotic value, but usually makes people feel gassy. And apparently it has a very low glycemic index. So that's something maybe we should look into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think glycemic index is also a whole other, we could have a whole webinar on glycemic index, right? <laughs> because the issue with glycemic index is rarely do you eat a food in isolation, right? right? So there, there's um, many people are chiming in on this as well. Just differentiating stevia, monk fruit from like a sweet and low. Um, the assumption is that perhaps stevia and monk fruit are better for us. I understand it's a bit more pro it's it's a little bit processed because you're not eating the natural. I think plant. if you were gonna choose between a stevia or a saccharin, for example, I probably would say that yes, the stevia probably is a healthier choice. Um, okay. Some of the artificial sweeteners that are out there, but generally speaking, I think we owe it to ourselves to really just become more accustomed to eating less um, sweet foods, and especially for the kids, like they're developing their palate and their dietary preferences, and if we're giving them these sugar substitutes, um, they really still are gonna want to have really sweet options in the future, so. This is a great suggestion from Perry Kaler. Um, great job, Perry. She suggests adding, you know, some spices, cinnamon and nutmeg, cocoa, vanilla, all can enhance flavoring and reduce the need for sugar. So great, great suggestion. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the tips, because that's one of the things that we do with the recipes, all the recipes and half the sugar, all the love, you'll notice that the spices are amped up 
Um, and that's one of the tricks that we use for reducing added sugar. Okay, I wanna be mindful of time here too. So let's go on to our next myth, which is, I hear this a lot as well. So I don't eat very many sugars, um, therefore um, my added sugar consumption is low. So like true or false, yes or no, um, I don't really eat sweets, so I'm guessing my sugar consumption is pretty low. So tell us what you think there. Yeah, oh like guys, any benefit to coconut sugar? Coconut sugar right. is in the category of added sugars. It's That's an added sugar too. Show, so it's definitely okay. not a healthier substitute. Okay. All right, so let's, um, I'll give this one more minute. So I think this comes up a lot when, um, you know, some, some people will say, oh yeah, I'm really a savory person. I, I don't like sweets all that much. So I don't really need to watch my added sugar consumption. Um, all right, I'm gonna end this poll now and share the results. Um, I think most of you, know now that um, that's not true. And the reason why is uh, what we call sneaky sugars. So added sugar can show up in a lot of unexpected places. For example, a packaged creamy poppy seed dressing. I'm gonna show you how to make this today with pear, sweeten it with pear instead of sugar. But uh, one serving of this salad dressing has as much added sugar as a donut. So, um, you know, you can be thinking, oh yeah, I'm making a healthy salad and I'm topping it with this dressing and you'd be surprised how much added sugar is inside. Um, another, this is a packaged tomato soup, um, which has uh, 17 grams of added sugar per serving. Um, you don't need sugar to make tomato soup. Um, in the book, we sweeten ours with carrots, which give it sweetness and also a velvety texture without cream. <coughs> um, but you know, that's as much added sugar as a snack cake, a packaged snack cake. Granola bars, some granola bars can have as much <coughs> sugar as a candy bar. That's another one that sort of has a bit of a health halo. Flavored yogurt as well. Um, people tend to think, oh, it's yogurt and granola, it's a healthy choice. And sometimes um, those products can have as much added sugar as a sweet <laughs> ice cream. So we're advocating for make some simple swaps. We're gonna show you how to do that. Um, we've got some tips here that we're sharing today. There are a lot more of those tips in the book. Um, but I think it's just really important to be aware that added sugar also sneaks into savory foods and places where you're not expecting it. So there have been a few questions on how many grams of sugar, and I know you had that slide up before, but for essentially women, most of us, I believe in this audience are, I don't know if there are any men in the audience, women, if, what is it, um, about, about 25 24. grams, yeah. 24 grams a, a, a day, and that's including your added and your natural sugars, and it's, men is 36 grams a day. So yeah. someone said, added pay sugar. attention to that. 24 grams of added sugar. Right, 24 grams of added sugar. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. six teaspoons. Yep. Okay, all right, so let's talk about some things that you can do, and then we're gonna dive into cooking, okay? Um, cook more, right? So half of your added sugar consumption or half of added sugar consumption comes from beverages, sugar sweetened beverages. So if you can make one big change there, you're going to make a big impact. The other half comes from the food that you eat. So when you can cook, you uh, regain control over what's going into your food, um, reducing processed foods because a lot of processed foods contain added sugar when you're not expecting it that can help make a really positive change. So really cooking is the antidote to added sugar. Um, we're gonna talk today about some ways that you can sweeten naturally. And, and Jeannie, one of the guests mentioned this. Um, in the book, what we do is we use fruits and vegetables to sweeten instead of added sugar. So pumpkin or pear or um, apple or dates, these are 
the fruits and vegetables that we lean on to boost flavor without added sugar. Um, we also use spices liberally because those can help create um, a sense of sweetness and boost flavor without sugar. And uh, toasted nuts and seeds. So um, Anisha has a food allergy in her family, a nut allergy in her family. So all the recipes can be made with seeds instead. Um, but that those toasting nuts and seeds helps, again, boost flavor, add texture and interest um, that make you miss the sugar a little less. So the big takeaway is fiber rich, those fiber rich fruits and vegetables are the keys to sweetening with less added sugar. So really quickly, I'm just going to breeze through this because it may be less relevant now. Um, so there's now actually a new um, food label. So many of you have probably noticed the nutrition labels have a line item for added sugars, but really quickly before it was really challenging to figure out how much added sugar was in a product. Um, these two labels show an example from like a vanilla um, low fat yogurt that actually has added sugar in it. So it's been sweetened with um, sucrose or just to granulate sugar versus a plain low fat um, yogurt of the same exact brand. And so before the sugars included not only the added sugar, the sucrose, but also the lactose, which is present in the yogurt. Um, and so if you wanted to figure out how much added sugar was in that, you'd have to compare it to a comparable product that didn't have added sugar, such as the plain yogurt, and then subtract. So you'd get 29 minus 15, get 14 grams of added sugar. Then you have to take that number and divide it by four to figure out how many teaspoons of um, added sugar there are per serving. And so it is quite a bit of work, and especially for families who have lower literacy level, figuring out this information is extremely confusing. But now there is the added sugar on the label. Most of the products should have that there, so it will be a little bit easier, but you'll still need to divide by four um, if you're thinking in teaspoons. Um, in Chile, they do have actually a stop sign on um, package items that is in black and says, you know, it's high in added sugar, high in fat, and that has really helped to actually improve healthier um, food options and choices among um, all the individuals living in that country. So it'd be great to see something like that here in the U.S. as well. So also in the past, you, you couldn't tell if it was an added sugar or a natural sugar. You had to look at the ingredient list. So now yes. with, the new, with the new nutrition fact label that we're supposed to start January 2020, uh, there is that line item for added sugars, which is quite helpful. Yeah, so this is a package of Skittles. And you can see on, I don't know if you can see on there in the camera, it's hard to see. 20 but. grams of added sugar per serving. Um, it's separated out for you. <laughs> um, but you know, you'll also find like some products, um, the smaller manufacturers are not required to have that label yet. And then also, so you won't see it on those. And then also if there's a larger manufacturer, but a product that hasn't yet expired, you're, you may see that on the shelf without the added sugar label yet or listed yet. So um, there, it's gonna be like this time of transition for us while we're trying to figure out what's in there, but hopefully we've given you some ways to figure it out. Okay, one last slide and then we're going cooking demo. All right, so some small things that you can do, right? Um, try a low sugar breakfast, right? Even if you just start the day with something that is um, a healthier option is great. What I love to do for my family is I make these pumpkin spice waffles from the book. Um, it makes a big batch. I put them in the freezer and then I just pull them out and they go into the toaster. It takes a couple, couple seconds, right? A couple minutes to toast them up and it makes a really wholesome and um, satisfying breakfast. So trying to keep sugar low at breakfast is a good thing. These waffles, for example, a typical waffle with syrup has about 16 teaspoons of added sugar per serving. These have one and a half. Um, so it's a pretty dramatic difference. Um, the other thing that you can do make a dressing or a sauce or a condiment. I'm going to show you how to make the creamy poppy seed dressing today. It's super easy. It takes two minutes in the blender and it can be used not only as a salad dressing, but also as a marinade, as a dip. Like it's just super helpful. Um, and then drink wa uh, fruit infused water. I mean, just drink water. Um, and if you need to add some flavor to it, just put some sliced fruit and vegetable in there. 
um, to boost up the flavor without sugar, you know? So there's some small steps that you can take here that really help result in big changes. Okay, I'm gonna transition over to my cooking area. Um, I'm gonna turn off this screen. Jeannie and, and Dr. Patel are gonna be with you for a minute and then I'm gonna walk you through making the recipes. So I'll see you in one minute. Okay, Anisha, I'm gonna throw a few questions to you. Sure. Um, question from Jenny Hayden. Isn't drinking apple juice, orange juice, et cetera, the same as drinking Gatorade or Coke? So that is a great question. So the current recommendations for juice intake actually um, by the, um, you know, I mentioned that there's these new beverage recommendations for zero to five year olds that I think can apply to the older kids as well. Um, it's important to think about reducing your juice intake. So um, for younger children, um, four to six ounces, older um, adults can be up to eight ounces. But generally speaking, um, I think a lot of um, pediatricians out there and other health professionals feel like it's important to eat whole fruit and drink water and, and really try to limit your juice intake. So it does have a lot of sugar. It is naturally occurring sugar, but there's basically the fiber that we've been talking about that's very protective have basically been stripped away from that juice. Um, and so um, that's a great question. And juice then there's one, great. one other question that um, Nina Hamnak is confused with and maybe others are as well. Why is the added sugar so important? I thought the total sugar number is what we should look at. Yeah, so um, the total sugar includes the healthy sugars. So to give you an example just from the juice, as a, I think juice is a great example of this. So let's say you're drinking a glass of juice. That juice is made from usually four oranges. And because the fiber is stripped away, you're not gonna feel full after drinking that glass of juice. However, if you were to sit there and eat an orange um, and eat four oranges, you probably wouldn't be able to do that in one sitting. So that just gives you an example of how, the, how that fiber actually helps to slow absorption of the um, sugar in your body. So your body's able to accommodate that sugar rush. Um, you know, your liver is not getting a big hit. Um, in addition, the fiber also helps you to feel more full. Um, and so we definitely want, don't want to reduce all sugar intake. It's mainly the added sugar. Otherwise, we wouldn't eat any fruits or vegetables either. Sugar okay. Hey, ladies, are you ready to go? Yep. All right. Anisha, okay. Awesome. Anisha, you and I are going to, are going to. Can everybody hear me? Give a thumbs up. Maybe post into the Q&A. My daughter, Kate, is here with us today. and She's my production assistant. So she's doing the Q&A while I'm talking to you. And hopefully you can see what's going on. You need to All change right, so the screen, Jen. The first recipe that I'm going to share with you yeah, you're, is... We're seeing the, the PowerPoint presentation. We're seeing the pre uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, hold on a second. Everyone's seeing the PowerPoint presentation. Hold on. Let me turn up this screen share. Better? Yeah. Is that better? Yep. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. All right, so this is a mason jar salad. I, I made this a couple, actually, can you pull out of the fridge, the one that I made? It's on the top shelf. Okay, so I made a couple of these this week because they're super easy. I think it's on the top shelf. Um, top right. Okay, great. Um, and the reason why I love this, the dressing is that cream. Hold on one sec, Jen. Can everyone see Jennifer? But I'm getting with hair instead. Okay, um, yeah, this is the one that was in my fridge that I made this week and didn't show you how to do it. Okay, so the, the base of this recipe, the reason why it's so delicious is because of these pears. And I use Bartlett pear. Um, I was not able to get Bartlett pear today. Um, so I'm using Deandu and that's fine. Um, Bosque, maybe not sweet enough. All right, so I'm putting this into the blender. All right, that's one pear. Then there is um, about a quarter cup of olive oil, three tablespoons of white wine vinegar. Uh, there's some Dijon mustard here and I'm trying to find my, um, okay, this spatula to get it in there. Okay, so Dijon mustard, a little bit of honey. Okay, so this is adding some extra sweetness there. Um, in addition to the pear. So the honey goes in and then salt and pepper. Okay. So, uh, then you throw it all into the blender. Oh, question. Someone has a question. Will the recipe be an email follow-up? 
Yes, recipe is an email follow-up. So we will be sending this to everyone so that you can make this one at home. The other question okay, I have, so Catherine, I can you- all that up into the blender. Can I ask a question real quick, Catherine? Question. Question. What if, what if pears, you know, we re, our big emphasis is to use seasonal fruit. So if pears are not in season, is there a substitute? Could you, we use something frozen? What would frozen you- pears? Yeah, you can use frozen pears. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wonder if it would work with that. That's actually a really good question. I should riff on this and see if I can do you some other fruits. Buy them and then freeze them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buy them and freeze them. They're still available now, so I would buy them and freeze them. Okay. All right. So let's blend this thing up. Oh, how about turning on the blender? That works. Um, okay. There you go. And you're done. So you end up with something like this, which is so beautiful. The color is awesome. Then you're putting in a couple um, teaspoon and a half, I think it is. No. Um, um, poppy seed. Okay, so just stir that in afterwards. And um, store it in a mason jar or a small container like this. Now I have mine. Um, and you're ready to go. It's that easy. Okay, so if you're gonna make the salad then, I prepped all of these ingredients um, yesterday. And the nice thing about this is you can be flexible, right? So the recipe calls for butternut squash. I couldn't find that yesterday, so I used meat potato instead. Um, can you guys see that okay? Is it, are everybody able to see what I'm doing? Thumbs up, okay. Um, I made some um, farro here, okay, so a nice grain at the bottom. If you want to leave that out, you can leave that out. We've got kale. Um, so any kind of kale is going to do here. And some Brussels sprouts, nice source of vitamin C here. Um, typically, I would put pomegranate seeds in, but um, we couldn't find any, so I'm using apple instead fine and toasted pumpkin seeds as well as shaved parmesan so what you're going to do is essentially layer it up okay so you put the dressing at the bottom of your jar like this then you're going to add your base layer to kind of separate the um the lettuces from everything else so just put your farro in at the bottom like that, okay? Then I've got sweet potato going in, okay, creating another nice layer there, okay? Then my apple goes in, okay, like this, okay? That's where the pomegranate seeds might be if you have those. Um, I couldn't find them. Your kale goes in next, okay, like so. And then some Brussels on top. So your leafy greens are separated from the dressing on the bottom and that will help keep them fresh longer. Um, so your Brussels go on top. Then I put a little bit of Parmesan cheese on as well as some toasted pumpkin seeds. Uh, top it with a little salt and pepper. I have a question. So this can stay in your fridge for a couple days. Can question. I, Someone has question. a question. Okay, what's your question? Can you treat the chopped apples with any lemon juice or something to inhibit it from browning? You put lemon juice on the apples. Oh, I did put lemon juice on the apples. Yes, because that helps them from turning brown. Um, so adding that just really helps. So like, this is great, right? These are two, there, there you go, two lunches, completely done. Um, keeps in your fridge for a couple of days. Uh, and it's just nice to have a make ahead. You can do this in a big bowl too. Sometimes I'll just serve this for dinner as a big bowl. Um, so that's an easy one to make. I like it a lot. This dressing as well can be used, like I talked about, it can be used as a marinade for um, vegetables, or it can be used as a marinade for um, chicken or fish. It can also be used as a dip. 
Um, it's just a really great, helpful thing to keep on hand. Because the pears are fresh, um, you don't want to keep this for more than a week. It's got the vinegar in there, but still, um, not more than a week, okay? Um, but you probably won't, they won't last that long anyways. At least it doesn't in my house. We use that right away. Okay, so that's one of my favorite recipes. The next is this brownie um, recipe. It's one of the most favorite in the book. Um, I made a batch last night. So these are uh, sweet with a sweet potato, and uh, they have a little bit of almond butter and maple syrup in there too to sort of build up the sweetness. They are less than half the sugar of a box brownie mix, and they are gluten-free too. So the sweet potato is what forms the whole base in here. So this recipe just hits all the right notes. And for anybody who's feeling like, I need to make myself a treat, and we're kind of stressing out, uh, this is a great choice. And this recipe will also be available um, in the follow-up show notes that will be sent. Um, the other reason why I love this recipe so much is we make it in the food processor. So if you have kids at home, this is a super, well, first of all, it's just easy. And secondly, it's a super fun way to get them involved because everything goes into the food processor. And that's just cool. Um, so what we start with here is some sweet potato. And this was just boiled so that it's fork tender. Question? Substitutes for nut butter? Oh, yeah. This is a really great point. Okay. So substitutes for nut butter. Um, I have to try this a couple different ways. I tried it with tahini, and I didn't like it because I didn't think it was sweet enough. The almond butter and the peanut butter create more sweetness than the tahini, so I would not recommend using tahini here. Um, possibly sunflower seed butter could work. I have not tried it, so I can't verify. Anisha may have tried it that way and could tell. Um, she tr she's tried it with the almond butter um, because she doesn't have an allergy there. And so, you're using um, unsweetened almond butter. That's a great follow-up. Oh, Correct. Another question. You're using sure, unsweetened sorry. almond butter? These are brownie. Oh, that's a really great point. Um, I can look it up on the box. It's actually in the notes in the book. Actually, Anisha, can you look that up in the notes in the book? Um, while I'm cooking, because I don't remember it offhand. I know how that much, a typical how much sugar has, uh, oh, here, I have it. One and a half and teaspoon. A, half, a typical brownie has four and a half teaspoons of added sugar. Our this one is one, one and a half. And a half. Wait, yeah. Okay. Something. What's that? Wait, did she want to say something? Okay, um, I'm gonna keep going. Wait, so, wait, wait, wait. Somebody's she, talking. Jan wanted it, to say something. Yeah, the um, almond butter that's unsweetened, correct? Just almonds. Unsweetened. Unsweetened almond butter. Um, yeah unsweetened and actually you know i'm using peanut butter today because i'm all out of almond butter <laughs> you think i when i went and stocked up i forgot to put that in the box so um so the almond or peanut butter is going in today it tastes really really good then um an egg and one egg yolk so what you'll notice in the recipes too in the book we do um, use egg yolks to help things bind. When you take the sugar out, um, the texture is impacted. And one of the questions that we got in advance was, oh, can I just, you know, cut the sugar in whatever recipe by a third? And will that work? Um, generally, I would say no. The texture gets impacted really significantly. We had three professional chefs working with us, and these recipes took over a year and a half to develop. So, the reason why is it's really tricky when you take the sugar out to maintain the texture and flavor um, is really hard to do. So one of the tricks that we use is the, um, the egg yolk. Um, Greek yogurt is another really good trick, whole milk Greek yogurt, and then that doesn't um, increase saturated fats too much. Okay. Like so. Okay, so try to set up until it's sort of a smooth taste. Okay. Oh, the melted butter. I forgot the melted butter. Okay, hold on one second. I will 
was wondering why it wasn't blending the right way. And there's a stick of butter that goes in. You can use coconut oil too. Um, so I'm just heating that back up and I'm gonna pop it in. Give me a second. Um, we've had we've had other events where we've talked about coconut oil and the dangers of coconut okay. oil with the saturated fat. So I would I would probably err on the side of um, not using the coconut oil, but maybe more butter. Okay, so my butter is going in. Uh, you can use coconut oil instead. Blend that up. There we go. Question when I'm done. Okay. All right. So scrape the sides here. Then what's going in is a quarter cup of maple syrup and two teaspoons. Question? You want to ask? Yeah, sure. Um, um, in old fashioned recipes for banana bread, can we reduce sugar by a third without altering the texture? Oh, that's really tricky. I mean, each one is going to depend. Um, each recipe is going to depend. I would say you will notice a difference in texture if you reduce the sugar. Um, there's actually a really delicious banana bread recipe in the book um, that was reviewed by the Washington Post and they loved it. Um, it actually has zero added sugar. Um, I use dates and Greek yogurt in that recipe instead. Um, but in general, what I would say is if you take the sugar out, even a third, you are going to notice a difference in texture. Um, what's called the crumb in a baked good, like the, the, you know, how, how chewy it is or how bouncy it is, is going to get impacted. And like, if you've ever say swapped applesauce for what's in your baked good, and then you get this weird spongy texture, like that's why that's happening. There's too much moisture in there. So it really, um, it really takes some food science to make it work. So that we've done the hard work for you with the recipes in the book um, to make it easy. Okay, so I added the maple syrup here. Um, and that's not because it's better than a different kind of sugar, it's just I wanted that maple flavor in there um, and unsweetened cocoa powder. Question? Uh, I, do you want me to do all, oh, okay. Yeah, let me blend a little bit. Okay, so I'm blending this up now. So kids love the food processor. This is just a much more And if you can use that. Okay, pause and stir. Yes. Okay, question. Um, if we're going to drink a boba tea, for instance, if we yes. eat something high fiber at the same time, does that help at all? Oh, this is a really, really great question. <laughs> if you have fiber in the system. Yeah, right, right. Um, Anisha, you want to address that question? So the question is Sure, I just, I actually. Boba and then eat something that has high fiber at the same time. Does that cancel things out? Sure, I just actually have been going through and responding to everyone's questions online. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, that is actually a great question. So as we mentioned, um, the majority of your added sugar consumption actually here in the US. I'm adding salt and baking soda. Uh, beverages so the sugar sweet beverages are the biggest culprit and you know these boba teas and other coffee drinks that are out there are packed a ton of added sugar so it's really important to take a look at those um, and really reduce consumption of those um, sugar sweet beverages the book actually has a number of recipes for horchatas aguas frescas um, there's some coffee drinks in there as well um, hot chocolate that have a lot less added sugar that you can try out. Um, and I think making any of those beverages at home definitely will be a healthier option. Or you can ask when you're going to purchase the beverage to ask them to actually not add um, as much added sugar, uh, the syrups that they use to prepare the beverage at the actual um, coffee store or the tea store. So, are we ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is what your mixture looks like in the food processor when you're all done. Um, you're going to take your chocolate chips and stir it in. Don't blend them in because it will chop up all the chocolate. So you're basically just going to stir it around in there. Can you see that? Can you see that on the camera okay? Tilt it like this? Yeah. Okay, so just stir it all together. 
And then it's going to go into your prepared 9 by 13 baking um, dish like this. Two questions. Okay, question two. Um, can we use one quarter cup of olive oil to, to substitute for one cup solid fat? Is the ratio one to one olive oil to melted butter? Um, I think the issue with the um, olive oil is going to be that it will, in the finished product, won't, um, I haven't tested it that way, and I think in the finished product it won't um, get you the texture that you want. So I would recommend using the coconut oil for the butter. One more question. Okay, another question. Um, we do ask for 30 percent sweetness, but I was wondering if we can high five with this if it would have just said I think so. similar question. Okay. I'm spreading this in the pan now. Okay, so just spread it out, make a nice um, pattern so that the top of your brownie looks good. And then um, and then what you're gonna do is top with the remaining chocolate chips is just two tablespoons. And then you bake it for 350, 27 minutes. Um, and then you're done, that's it, it's that easy. So, all right, so this is now going into the oven. Ta-da, done, 27 minutes. Okay, let's take some questions. Um, okay, here's one. Oh, okay. Um, I can flip back over onto this. There was a question five. Okay. Do you want to turn this off now and I'll turn it on? Um, so just to reiterate all of this, all these recipes will be on my website. As soon as we're done here, I will add them so you can download them yourself. And the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation will be up there as well. Again, website is soulfoodsalon.com. Okay, so that was an experiment. <laughs> That's my first time ever doing a webinar while also cooking. Um, but hopefully that worked. Oh, hi, James. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've got like school going on in the other room. My husband's working outside. This one is just, we're making it work. Um, someone had asked the question, I think, uh, about the olive oil. I know that some recipes you can use olive oil, um, but not every recipe you can. So you got to pick and choose. And like, I know that Annie Fenn, who did a salon for me recently, Brain Health Kitchen, her website, she's got a bunch of tried and true recipes that she has used olive oil. Because honestly, the, the jury's out on the, on the negatives to uh, coconut oil. It can, it can alter your uh, cholesterol. If you're gonna use coconut oil, the recommendation is use it sparingly. I would not use it as like a primary cooking oil, so. Yeah, so I think, I, I think with all the recipes too, what I would say is, I'm not gonna be confident giving you a recommendation unless I've made it and prepared it in a way that I think is delicious. So, um, so we, had, you know, we had a number of families testing with us, a number of professional chefs testing with us to make sure that the recipes were rock solid. Um, and we give you lots of alternatives in the book. Um, I, but if I, it's not a way that I've made it already, I'm going to be kind of reluctant to tell you to do that just because I want you to, if you're going to spend the time to make a recipe, I want it to be totally awesome. Great. Um, I don't, I don't think there are any other questions. Anybody? Oh, wait, here. What is it? Uh, yeah, why don't we take like just a couple more minutes? I know people have to peel off now. It's 12 o'clock. So why don't we take a couple more questions and then. Um, this is a question that's come up a few times. Um, just trying to combat sugar cravings. Um, any tips on getting through the withdrawal phase? In fact, um, that just reminds me of, so one thing I didn't mention, but I have a health and wellness newsletter that I put out a few times a month called Soulful Insights. And if you are not subscribed to that, I'm happy to add you to the list. You can go on my website and subscribe. And in fact, this very topic is being addressed next week, all about sugar and sugar cravings. So Jennifer and Anisha can chime in right now on this, but just a, a, a thorough and research-based response will be in your email box in a week if you choose to subscribe. Yeah, I think I see a question here, just cutting back on sugar, you know, it's really hard to have those strong cravings in response. How do you get through the withdrawal phase? 
And what I would say is like transitioning to sweetening with fruits and vegetables and using those fruits and vegetables instead of sugar will help to adjust your preferences over time. Um, so that first week or two are going to be a little more challenging, but once you um, once your palate readjusts, you're going to start to notice that um, the flavor of those fruits and vegetables comes through more and you don't need the sugar as much. I think the other point too is just not to have it in the house um, because if it's there, you know, you'll grab it. So just trying to limit what's available to you um, where you're working or living. Right. Create, create the environment that's positive. So in that vein, um, Angie Neeson, the physician that I mentioned to you from San Diego at Flavors for Wellness, MD, she, um, she writes, so I tie planetary health to all of my teaching and what I tell my families in my office and also at the YMCA, I say that eating things out of packages have added things that are not good for you or the environment. So be mindful of consuming them for both of those reasons. So thank you for contributing that, Angie. Yeah. Um, question here about how much sugar and calories is in one of the brownies. Okay, so um, this is also important. All of the recipes in the book have full nutritional information and analysis included with each one. At the very top of each recipe, you see an icon that shows how much added sugar is in the recipe versus a packaged ingredient or packaged version of that, as well as the full nutritional analysis. So in the brownies, um, there are 136 calories per brownie. Uh, the added sugar in our brownie is one and a half teaspoons or six grams. The typical amount of added sugar you'd find in a brownie, a packaged brownie is four and a half teaspoons. That's, uh, do the math, 16, 16 grams, 16 plus 18 grams. Um, uh, Fiber is two grams, protein is three grams. This is in our brownie per serving. Um, carbohydrates, 12 grams. So we've listed out um, sodium, carbohydrates, the basically the big macronutrients, as well as um, fiber and uh, sodium and added sugar with every single recipe in the book. Uh, okay, here's a question. Where does wine fit into your sugar intake? Uh, yeah, this comes up a lot. <laughs> Especially now that we might need that during this crisis right. time. I think it's okay to have a glass of wine. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to just kind of summarize everything and, and we can keep fielding a question or two. But so thank you so much, Jennifer and Anisha. This has been awesome. Go out and, and buy their cookbook for the first 25 people that logged on. We are going to be sending you guys, um, courtesy of Jennifer, um, a cookbook of Half the Sugar, All the Love. Um, all of her information will be on my website, all the links to their contacts, etc. Follow them on their social media as well. Um, recipes will be there. PowerPoint presentation will be there. And as soon as we upload this video to YouTube, that will be up on my um, channel at Soul Food Salon. Uh, you guys could finish up if there's anything more. No, people can, and people can always reach out with questions. If they want to email me, I'm jennifer at 52newfoods.com. You can it, ask me any question there. Um, you can also find me on Instagram. I'm at Jennifer Tyler Lee. So um, anywhere you want to find me, I'm happy to answer your questions. And I love to see what you're cooking. Like now, now people have a couple of recipes to get started with this weekend. Um, there are lots of recipes from the book too that are available in various places online. We can share some of those resources too. So I just hope people feel like they have some easy things that they can do to get started. And I hope that this, I hope this Zoom format worked for everybody and stay tuned because we might just be doing a few other salons this way as well. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I don't, are there any Thanks other questions? Everyone. Yep, I'm going to end it right here. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye bye. Be Have well. A good day.